As an introduction, we'd like to acknowledge that our mission at Vos Library is to advance learning, inspire curiosity, enrich lives, and promote community. With that in mind, let me introduce our guest. An historian, Max Smith, uses research and interviews to trace the making of the movie Peyton Place, as well as what happened after the crews left and the premiere of the film. He is a Navy veteran of the first Gulf War and former news reporter for the Bar Harbor Times. He lives in Stockton Springs, Maine, in the village of Sandy Point, where he's restoring the family homestead. He's a graduate of the University of Maine at Orono, and Peyton Place comes to Maine, comes home to Maine. The making of the iconic film is his second book. Without further ado, please help me welcome Mac Smith. Uh, well, thank you very much, Deborah, and I want to say thank you to the good folks at the Vos uh, Memorial Library for this kind invitation, and I'd like to say thank you to everybody who is here this evening. Uh, I am Max Smith. I'm here from Stockton Springs. I'm about uh, an, uh, 45 minutes or an hour up the coast. I'm between Belfast and Bangor, and this is my second book. Peyton Place Comes Home to Maine, The Making of the Iconic Film. It's published by Down East Books, the same good people who bring you Down East Magazine. And we're going to go back in time, and I want you to picture it. It's April 1957, and the headline in the Camden Herald reads, Novel Too Hot for Vermont May Be Filmed in Maine. And Peyton Place, why was it controversial and how did it end up here in Maine? The book was considered, was controversial because of what was considered the obscene nature of the content of the book. The book was very much about nature. It was about the nature outside of us and the nature inside of us. And it was uh, dotted with graphic depictions of of physical activity, intimate physical activity. And adding to the controversy, the book's author, Grace Metallius, she had based the story on a real life event and she got into a feud with her neighbors. Her husband was fired from his job as a high school principal and Grace Metallius had a way of turning all this publicity into book sales. Before, uh, Peyton Place was banned in several places throughout the United States and in the entire country of Canada. Uh, and with every banning, there'd be a news story. And with every news story, the sales went up the charts. Uh, Peyton Place was number one on the bestseller list for 23 weeks, and it would sell 9 million copies uh, when it first came out. Now there was a producer in Hollywood, Jerry Wald. He was a producer with 20th Century Fox. And he bought the rights to the book uh, even before it hit, hit the newsstands. And he wanted to capitalize on the publicity surrounding this book. And that's how Peyton Place eventually comes to Maine. Basically two events collided together, Jerry Wald, bought the uh, rights out in California, and he wanted to get production started as fast as possible. He wanted to capitalize on the publicity and get the film into theaters as soon as possible. And he was also very practical. He knew he needed to complete filming, uh, hopefully in the month of June when traffic would be better, when there would be less tourism. And uh, so he was in a hurry. He uh, first looks at the state of New Hampshire where Grace Metallius, the book's author lived. And the book was set in New Hampshire. And that's why they needed a New England state to film it in. Uh, Grace Metallius was not very receptive to Hollywood officials and they took New Hampshire out of consideration. They went to Vermont and toured some areas in Vermont, Woodstock, Vermont to be specific. And 
after three weeks of waiting for an answer from the officials in Woodstock, Vermont, whether they could film there or not, they basically were denied permission. So they came to the third choice, which was the state of Maine. Now, this, I said there were two events going on, one in Hollywood, the other event was here in Maine. The Camden Rockport Chamber of Commerce had just launched an advertising campaign, uh, spending several thousand dollars on this campaign. There was an advertisement campaign in the New York Times for the area. They were promoting tourism. Everybody was driving now and Camden already had its share of tourists, but they wanted to get more of that uh, automobile traffic. So when, camp, when Hollywood officials came knocking at their door, they were more than receptive, as opposed to the other places that the Hollywood officials had gone to. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now there were four towns being considered in the state of Maine. There was Skowhegan, Wiscasset, Waterville, and Camden. Um, on April 23rd, two Hollywood executives arrived in Maine the art director and the production manager. And they toured these four different towns. And two days later, the film's director, Mark Robson arrives in Camden and he's gonna make the final decision on which location to use. And there was, uh, he was received on the day he arrived in Augusta the Lewiston Evening Journal ran an editorial opposed to the filming of Peyton Place in Maine. And it reads in part, how anybody could feel anything less than horror at the idea of his hometown being used as the background for a movie to be made from one of the filthiest novels of our day is a little hard to see. Publicity and notoriety have not been the same in the past, but apparently Camden thinks so. It is to the credit of Vermont that citizens of Woodstock would not allow Peyton Place to be filmed there, and the movie people knew better than to try it in New Hampshire. Maine's desire to get down and wallow in the pigsty of what is modern day Hollywood must seem strange indeed to those who have labored hard in days gone by to make Maine a great and respected state. Now, uh, the other large newspapers in the state jumped in on the subject with editorials for and against and sort of down the middle. But that's how the director of the movie was welcome to Maine. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Robson toured all four towns. Uh, Camden was the last town. And before he left Camden, he made the official announcement that Camden would be the uh, site for filming. Now things started to gear up very quickly because filming was gonna start in a month. On the West Coast, a <clears throat> script writer was brought in to clean up the book of Peyton Place into a movie script that would uh, ha had to pass the censors, the Legion of Decency. And uh, so he had quite a job on his hands. On the East Coast, Camden and the areas surrounding it were getting uh, ready. Uh, the town manager of Camden proclaimed a cleanup week for the town where uh, residents could bring out lawn debris and stuff to the side of the road and the town would pick it up and throw it out. They were painting everything they could, fixing up the town. Uh, the local IGA even gave out free flower seed packets with every purchase. <laughs> Excuse me. And then very quickly, national reporters starting, started to arrive in Camden. And they were looking for controversy. They seemed to have a preconceived story that basically the people of small town Camden, Maine were being hoodwinked by these Hollywood producers and nothing could be further from the truth. And the more they interviewed the people on the street, they couldn't get that story. The biggest story they came out with was that the Camden Library did not carry Peyton Place. And towards the end of May, the uh, trucks full of equipment started to arrive in Camden. 
They were stored in a parking lot near the uh, police station there. Shortly thereafter, the movie executive started to arrive. Um, and everybody set up shop at the visitor center at the public landing, the wharf in Camden. And it was a very small building. And uh, part of it was being used by the movie executives and part of it was being used by the three members of the Camden Chamber, Camden Rockport Chamber of Commerce, who were in charge of casting the 1500 extras that would be needed in the movie. And they were also in charge of getting period pieces because the movie was set in the 1940s, uh, about 10, 15 years before, before uh, the actual time. So they needed props and things like that. Excuse me. All right. On June 2nd, it's two days before filming is to begin and Diane Varsi and Lee Phillips arrive. And this is their first movie role for both of them. And they both have leads in the movie. The uh, movie company takes them around different places in Camden with reporters following them for a little publicity. And, um, and then the stars of the movie sort of come in in a staggered fashion. They don't all arrive at once. And filming begins on June 4th. And there's a ceremony at the Arch on Union Street in Camden before filming begins. Before the day is up, there have been five scenes filmed. And the atmosphere in Camden was described as there being a sort of a singularity of purpose that summer and a spirit of kinship. Uh, people would, every day they would go to specific locations to find the latest production schedule, which would change every day because of the main weather would, would cause changes in the scheduling. They listened to the local radio station for instructions on when to appear as extras. Members of the national press started to arrive. Uh, a reporter and photographer from Life Magazine arrived. And there was even talk of the Ed Sullivan show recording a, a uh, segment there, which never happened. And the cast and crew stayed at the Hotel Thorndike in Rockland. And a reporter from Boston asked a waitress what they did all the time. And she said all they did was drink coffee and talk about the movie. And the reporter asked a cab driver why they stayed in Rockland instead of Camden. And he said he thought they wanted to be living it up while they were here. Uh, now filming is taking place every day. Crowds appear at the different locations where the filming takes place. Uh, on June 12th and 13th, the filming moves up to Belfast and the majority of the filming is done in front of uh, Crosby High School. Now the scenes in front of the high school required extras, but it needed extras who had just a little bit more of an acting part. So the movie uh, executives turned to the drama club at Crosby High School called the Crosby Footlights Club and asked the members of that drama club to particip participate in those scenes, which they did, <coughs> excuse me. Now, during this period of time, there was a three day heat wave here in Maine. It was unusually hot. And uh, the cast and crew were sweltering and it was decided to take the cast and crew on a cruise on Penobscot Bay one evening, just to cool them off, show them the sights which they did, but the weird thing is they apparently, the boat that they arranged to take them on this cruise was a sardine carrier out of Port Clyde, Maine. And I'm just assuming, unless it was brand spanking new, that it must have smelt a little bad. So I've, I've always gotten a little kick out of that story. June 18th and 19th, they filmed the Labor Day picnic and parade scenes these are the scenes that require the most extras. And it's filmed over a two day period. It's very hot. And when you watch the movie, 
in some of the scenes, the extras are quite sunburned. And you can tell those are the scenes that were filmed the second day because a lot of people got sunburned the first day and they showed up on the second day. On June 20th, uh, scenes were shot at the Camden Amphitheater. And this was really the last day of major filming. That night, the cast and crew were treated to a fish chowder dinner um, at, an, at a club in Camden. And it was announced this day that Lana Turner, who was the movie's biggest name, would not be arriving in Maine for filming after all. Now, <clears throat> Lana Turner had been dangled in front of the people of Maine all this time. She was originally expected with, with the first stars that showed up. And every few days, it'd be a story in the newspaper explaining that she, there was a delay and she'd be here in a few more days. Then a few more days later, there'd be another story. And, and finally, when shooting wrapped up, it was announced she wouldn't be filmed here. She wouldn't show up here. And uh, one of the extras I talked to said that the people of Camden never forgave her for that. They took it as an insult and uh, never forgave her. Now on June 27th, the last of the <clears throat> actors have gone. The filming crew is still here. They have to film some more outside shots uh, that have been delayed because of the weather. But after all the actors leave, the Camden Herald says that Camden is unusually quiet like all the guests have left a large wedding. And, uh, but the people of Camden were looking forward to the Life Magazine story. Um, the photographer and reporter from Life Magazine had been everywhere during filming. And whenever there was a news story, it always mentioned that they were uh, there. Uh, for those who don't know, Life Magazine was an extremely popular magazine at the time, very large, magazine and known for its photography. And the people of Camden were greatly looking forward uh, to seeing how their uh, town was represented in this national, uh, this, this magazine was uh, received in millions of homes every week, I believe about 32 million at the time. And the news story was brief because they're known for their pictures, but I'm gonna read it I'm going to read it. <clears throat> Amidst adulation, a note of protestation. The movie company came cautiously to Camden, Maine this summer. All 20th Century Fox wanted to do was spread $100,000 or so around among the townspeople and in return use a little local scenery and about a third of the town's 3,700 people to make a movie of Peyton Place, a novel that hit number one on US best-selling lists for most of the past year. Peyton Place tells scandalous things about a little New England town, a lot like Camden, and there was worry about what Camden folk would think of it. The movie people need not have worried. On demand for $10 a day per man, mobs turned out for movie parades and picnics. For 250 extra to the owners, the streets were filled with 20 year old automobiles. Camden produced men, boys, women with children, dogs, a male quartet, a female sextet, and a retired sea captain who put ships in bottles. Then more people began to read this novel of rape, murder, and suicide, and the hair stood on end at the role Camden was playing. There were cries of indignation and letters of protest to the town manager but most Camdenites were having too much fun playing movie actor to pay much mind. Now, that story was very insulting because it portrayed the people of Camden, again, in that preconceived storyline, sort of simple hicks that have been hornswoggled by the movie executives. And the people of Camden knew full well what the book Peyton Place was about that headline had run in the Camden Herald, novel too hot for Vermont may be filmed in Maine. They, know, they knew full well what they were getting into and they were taking a stand for artistic uh, expression and freedom. And uh, there was a flurry of letters back and forth between town officials and Life Magazine um, 
and of course all that is in the book. Now the uh, <clears throat> premiere of Peyton Place actually took place in Camden in December of 1957. No stars from the movie were available, but uh, the studio was able to produce Betty Davis, a very big name, uh, who was married to Gary Merrill, a well-known star of the time who was also a Maine native. Uh, the premiere was in Camden at the movie theater there. And I always like to picture what it must have been like because it was just a few weeks before Christmas, almost uh, right around this time. And uh, Camden, which is beautiful to begin with, was all decorated for Christmas. There were trees on the streets, lights, just beautiful like only a small village in Maine can be. And uh, this is where the premiere happened. There were two seatings, both were sold out. Uh, people were here from different states. The press was here from uh, different states across the country. Uh, there had been speculation that our governor, Ed Muskie, would be at the premiere. There had also been speculation that he would be an extra in the movie. He didn't appear for either because there had been, uh, it had been a controversial project and Ed Muskie was looking at a run for the White House. So he stayed back. Now, the movie was well received, but at the end, a reporter from Rhode Island noticed that the book's author, Grace Metallius, wasn't at the premiere. So he called her at her home in New Hampshire. She wasn't available, but her manager answered the phone. He said that Grace Metallius was not invited. Now, Betty Davis contradicted that. She said she invited Grace Metallius personally. And it just shows how Grace Metallius had a way of turning simple things into controversy. She was a master at that. And then lastly, uh, the Oscars. The Oscars are late winter, uh, early spring of the next year. And Peyton Place receives nine nominations. And before the uh, winners are announced, the people of Camden send each nominee and the publicist of the movie, Don Prince, what they call their own version of their Oscars. They call them the Brewsters. It's a nice woolen shirt made at the uh, woolen mill in Camden and a certificate uh, personalized for each star. And then the people of uh, Hollywood sent a nice certificate back to the people of Camden in return. They had developed a very nice relationship between the people of Hollywood who were in Maine during the filming and the people of Camden and the surrounding areas. They all really seemed to get along and have a nice relationship. It was nice. Now, as it turns out, Peyton Place received uh, no Oscars, nine nominations, no Oscars. But it was the night of the Oscar awards that the movie's leading star, Lana Turner, she returned home from the ceremony to her home in California. And her boyfriend, who was a mobster named Johnny Stompanato, apparently abused her. And uh, she threw him out. A week later, he came back. Her daughter killed him. But it was all, that all started on Oscar night, uh, the year that Peyton Place was nominated. Um, and then the book talks a little bit about what happens after. Uh, Peyton Place is well remembered in Camden. Every year, every year in the state of Maine, uh, you're going to find several showings of the movie Peyton Place. They quite often will have a, ro a retrospective yearly down at Camden. Uh, and some of the extras who are in the movie will be there. They'll show a few films. It's quite nice. And uh, I believe it was the 50th anniversary of the premiere of the movie. They had a big, big event there. Uh, some of the children of the stars of the movie were there. Uh, the daughters of Grace Metallius were there. And it was, it was a big event. And it's still well remembered and should be because Camden and the surrounding areas and the people of Maine all took a stand for artistic freedom 
in the uh, face of great odds, you know, facing the backlash from magazines such as Life magazine and such. And Camden is bigger than ever. And, and uh, so it speaks to their credit. And I'm going to wrap up my talk right now and then turn it over and hopefully there might be some questions or stories that people might want to share. And I thank everybody for their time. Thank you, Mac. We don't have anything in the chat room yet. So I would just encourage people to unmute and ask away. We have some time with Mac and he's very interested in your questions. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Please. Um, I kind of remember the television series. I don't think I saw the movie, but I don't recall the television series as being particularly steamy or controversial. Was the movie a lot more so than the TV series was? Uh, the movie had been cleaned up considerably. The book was very steamy. Um, I'm going to assume there's not any children in the audience, uh, but I'll still be delicate. The main plot was it involved the rape between a stepfather and a and a, and his stepdaughter. Uh, the the book was incredibly steamy. It was peppered very generously with love scenes, we'll call them, and uh, but it was cleaned up. The, the rape, there was a rape scene in the movie. It was cleaned up as well as it could be. It was still pretty uh, dramatic. But yeah, the movie was quite cleaned up. I've only seen a few scenes from the, from the TV series. Uh, Jerry Wall, the movie producer who bought the rights, he actually bought the rights to the name Peyton Place. So Grace Metallius could no longer write any Peyton Place books on her own without his permission. She always resented him for that. Um, so uh, yes, I hope that answers your question. Max, someone um, placed in the chat room. Um, first of all, someone thanked you, said very interesting. Another person said, I've always liked the bicycle scene by Mira Lake. Was that shot at the same time? As far as I know it, well, yes, because um, the Camden Public Library, the Walsh History Center, they have a list of locations that were used in the filming. And they do mention Mirror Lake. And I believe they're alluding to that particular scene. So I'm 99% sure that was shot right down there. Yes. Okay, that was Anita. And Angie's asking, or she's telling you, great presentation, Mac. What inspired you to pursue this project? Uh, one thing I like about history, there were big events, and we know sort of about the hoopla of it, but we never get down to the, we never know the details. And I think once you put the details together, you get a much fuller uh, picture. And specifically to Peyton Place, knowing how controversial that book was when it came out and the movie, I knew there had to be more to the story than just Hollywood showing up and everybody having a fun summer. I knew there had to be more to it. And as I dug, I did find the controversy, which was, it was muted. It was more word of mouth. There were the big newspaper editorials. There were, were a few letters to the editor, which are in the book, but it was more, more like talking at the general store, which is how news still spreads and people express their opinions or used to. And um, so I just wanted to get behind that. I knew there had to be a good story and there really was uh, the Life Magazine story. It's, it's very interesting to see, uh, you know, just to see how Maine was portrayed and the controversy there. So yeah, it's nice to get behind the big stories and, and put, really put the facts together. Thanks, Mac. And your next question is uh, from Ruth. What has been the level of interest in your book? And is Peyton Place still in print? Do you have a copy of your book right there, Mac? 
I just want to do. I just want people to see the front cover and get familiar with it because we have ordered this for our Vos library, so it'll be on the um, the shelves soon there. So thanks for that. So again, Ruth yeah. is just asking, what's been the level of interest in your book, and then is Peyton Place still in print? Sure. Um, Peyton Place has been reprinted, uh, not by the original company that printed it, but another company has reprinted it. I know it's available on Amazon uh, and probably, you know, any place you can find a book. Um, the level of interest, the people from Maine who have read the book, are they love it. Um, I've had a few negative comments from people not from Maine who were looking more at it as a history of movies where Maine is just a little part of the story where I've written it this is a main story where Hollywood comes to see us and I think there's a little disappointment there which is fine but I've a few times so a walk down memory lane is what I've heard from a few people that have read it they you know it, it sort of takes you back in time just like watching the movie does and seeing the places and the scenery uh, overall it's been well received the timing of its release was unfortunate in that it was released in April and, and the quarantine started in March. Normally I, normally I would have done a lot of uh, in-person book talks and such. It's curtailed that, so word's not out as widely as it could be. But uh, overall, it seems like the reception's been pretty good. Well, we're excited to get it on our shelves at Vos. And your next question from Tim and Lori, did the town receive compensation for the filming location? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, what happened was the extras were paid, were paid, I think it was $5 a day that they worked. A lot of them contributed that money to a hospital fund. They were trying to build a hospital at the time. And so money went to that fund but there was no direct, I found no evidence of any direct compensation. There might have been, but I, I sincerely doubt it. One interesting story, there were some upper income residents of Camden who wanted to be extras in the movie, but they, I guess they were afraid of the stigma that the book had. So what they did was they, they specifically arranged to donate their money to the hospital and have that fact publicized uh, so that they could get away with being an extra in what could have been considered a dirty movie yet still keep their reputation. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mac. Next question. Um, this is from Joel. I think there was a scene or two up on Batty. Where was that shot exactly? <laughs> um, it was on Mount Batty. I've I have to say, I haven't been up there for about 30 years, so I cannot say exactly where, where up there it was shot. The interesting story to that is there was no road to Mount Batty at the time. They had one or two tons of equipment that had to be hand carried up the mountain. And this was uh, sensitive sound equipment that had to be treated very delicately. And uh, but it all had to be carried by hand. There was a little comment in the local paper that the people that witnessed that saw that Hollywood was not as glamorous as, as everybody assumed it, it was because, yeah. So I'm not exactly, exactly sure where it was on Mount Patty, but it was on Mount Patty. All right. And here's the power of Zoom. Listen to this. This is from Walter. Mac, greetings from Sydney, Australia. I think you and the book described perfectly what it is. So don't worry about naysayers. My copy arrived here in Sydney last week. Excellent job. Nice, That's very cool. nice. I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. All right. And then Lynn, um, thank you. Looking forward to reading it, questioning whether it's available on Amazon. Oh, yes. Yep, it's on Amazon. There is a Kindle version. Um, it's available on most online booksellers. Um, you can get it through Down East Books directly, which I believe is downeastbooks.com. 
Um, any local bookstore would be, if they don't have it, would be able to order it. I do know it's available at uh, one of the books. Um, I don't know how many bookstores are in Camden, but I know it's in a bookstore in Camden. So, yeah. Very good. Uh, just wondering if anybody else would like to unmute and ask any more questions or put them in the chat. We'll wait a minute for that. So Joel is asking, besides the courthouse scene, were any other scenes shot in Rockland? Yeah, so let's see. I don't have answer, I don't have answers off the top of my head. The courthouse scene, um, geez, uh, you know, I do not have a definite answer on that. I have a list of the Camden locations in here. From, okay, let's see, Rockland, Thorndike Hotel, that's where they stayed, nothing was filmed there. Rockland, uh, St. Bernard's Roman Catholic Church Sanctuary on Broadway. And uh, there was a, there's a sequence, it's Sunday morning and they show a bunch of different churches for those that have seen the movie. That would be that church. Uh, the courthouse, Union Street in Rockland. Uh, and some of the reporters that were actually covering the filming were pulled in to be extras in the filming of the courthouse scenes that involved the, the reporters. And there's a million little stories like that in there. Um, then that, that would be it for Rockland. So I did have to check my book. I did not have that at the top of my head. So. <laughs> All right. Angie's asking, what's your next project? Any idea? Yes, uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, my, I call it book three right now. It's in front of the editors at Down East Books. It's been there a while. I'm, I've been in touch with the editor. I expect a yes or no very shortly. Normally I don't reveal the subject, but I'm gonna because we're close and it's looking good. <laughs> the working title is Maine's Hail to the Chief. And there may be a subtitle such as a look at the main presidential visits. What it is, we've had 17 setting United States presidents visit Maine and literally from Washington to Trump. Um, Washington visited before we were a state, but he was on Maine soil. And it's a look at those visits of the setting presidents and they, a, a lot of controversy involved in those visits. A lot of visits occurred at just really crucial times in these presidencies. And there's a focus on Maine's reaction to the assassination of John F. Kennedy because he had visited Maine at University of Maine at Orono a month, about a month before he died. So hopefully in the next few weeks, I will have approval on that book. And I will say book four, I just sent it into them. And it's one that I'm especially proud of, but we've got a while for that. <laughs> Well, thanks for that teaser. Thank uh, you. Do you happen to have your other book? Um, do you want a little pitch on that? This is a Titanic focus? Sure, Mina's on the Titanic. Hold right on. Okay. <laughs> Oh, thank you for your patience. Uh, yeah. Maine is on the Titanic. This is my this is my book talk copy. It's got a, a little notes everywhere. But Maine is on the Titanic by Down East Books. It's a look at um, there are about fifteen different parties or families from Maine. Some some are residents, some year round residents. But it's their stories and full of details and quotes and. Uh, I have my first okay. book, I'm, I'm really proud of it. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for showing that, Mac. And um, Christy said, very good book, and we all look forward to your next one. <laughs> and Angie's asking, what inspired you to become a writer? Uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I grew up here in Stockton. It's a very small town. Um, 
I was, I had four brothers, but I was the youngest and it was kind of a gap. So I had to depend on my imagination a lot. And uh, I had ne has never failed me, not once. And, uh, you know, I'd walk along the, the Penobscot River and, and in the woods and, you know, just my imagination has always been full. And uh, I had to let some of it out. You just have to let some of it out. And, uh, and I've loved every second of it. So I, I don't know what, yeah, no one thing, just, just life kind of pushed me that way. And I'm very thankful for it. So. Mm -hmm. Terrific. We have a few more minutes if anybody else has any questions or comments for Mac. We'll wait for the chat room or you can unmute. Well, maybe we're all questioned out. That might be it. All right, well, I'm gonna do my little spiel to wrap up. Um, that concludes our presentation for this evening. And all of us at Vos Library, thank you for attending our Zoom with Vos Wednesday series. And we hope that you'll help spread the word and join us at next week's presentation with Bob Sewell and his wife, Mia Montello from Sewell Orchard, who will share how they make vinegar. So I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you again, Mac, for joining us. Be thank well, everybody, everybody, and stay healthy. Take care.